Achtung, Achtung. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray and James Holland. And uh, James, who are we talking to, do, to today? And um, this is going to be really interesting, I think. Um, yeah, I think yeah. it will be too. Go on. Um, well, we're talking to um, Bastian Willem and he is um, a young historian, I think it's good to say. He's also yes, he's considerably, to younger, the... considerably younger and younger than us. fresher faced than either of us old sods. Yeah. Um, he's been a research <laughs> fellow in modern European history at the University College London and is now at the LMU in, um, in Munich. Um, and he is an expert on the Wehrmacht at the end of the war in the East. So yeah. we've, we've dragged him on today to talk about particularly about, about Königsberg or Kaliningrad, as it now is, um, and uh, East Prussia and, uh, you know, the Wehrmacht fighting on German soil in 1944-45. And um, obviously uh, a, a bloody grim tale, if ever there was one. Welcome. Welcome, Bastian. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for for having me. I really, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, like, obviously, a big fan of uh, James Holland, and uh, my partner uh, was actually more smitten with uh, with with Al here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll take that too. Actually, you know, it's fine. Yeah, it's not all um, about looks. Words count too. Yeah. No, no, uh, Bastian, you're, 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 you're. I mean, I think we should, we should say this you're dutch um yes uh, i am um so uh, uh you know simple question how have you ended up um uh uh st- with this as your line of study yeah i get this question very very often and and here's the thing i have no family relations whatsoever uh, dating back to east prussia nor actually to uh, to, to Germany for for that matter my my family is is really as Dutch as they come and uh, for for generations we haven't moved basically one inch so no there's absolutely <laughs> nothing uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, that ties me to East Prussia so what it really was and I think this is uh, recognizable uh, for a lot of people is uh, as, a, as a very young kid I just I was interested in in the Second World War, and you read about uh, the Ardennes Offensive, you read about um, about Arnhem, you read about um, Normandy, and there's ample books, uh, like so many books are available on on these topics. What I found interesting uh, was actually the Eastern Front, and I found oh, there's uh, like it, it all seems to be very standard about what is written on it, and it's always you know, like this mass of Soviet. Uh, troops invading and I found this wildly wildly fascinating obviously uh, like the books that you read when you're a kid this is very much sort of like this this, this cold war narrative of yeah. sort of like this uh, this the, the Soviets as this this menacing group or this this Moloch almost if you will like this this, this steamroller yeah I found that very interesting uh, I, I knew I didn't understand it at the same time uh, when I talked with my grandparents uh, about this my grandmother's uh, brother uh, was sent to uh, to germany so as a as a dutch uh, dutch guy he volunteered to go to germany it, it was his, uh, his his good friend who was forced to to go to germany as a, as a forced forced laborer uh, but his friend had a kid and so he asked can i go in his stead and they said yes um, wow. He never came back from the war. Uh, he died somewhere in Germany, and my grandmother uh, basically never forgave the Germans. The, the Germans were always the the bad guys, right? Yeah. So, um, and I, again, I found that very interesting because to me, the idea that your neighbors, like being Dutch, right? So, like they're your neighbors, like you have this this group of people that that you're supposed to find sort of like intrinsically evil. Right. And I found yeah. that very interesting. So you have this to me, it was impossible to think all Germans are evil. And at the same time, there is this idea. Yeah, but it cannot be the, like, what is the situation with the like with the Soviets, with the Russians? I also didn't understand that. So that basically drove me 
to to the Eastern Front also because like as a, as a young kid that you know at the age of fifteen you you think you already read everything that there is to read about uh, Arnhem and about yeah. uh, about Normandy you know yeah. like you you read five books and you think you know I I know this all right and um, <laughs> so uh, so 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 that was me done on on the Western Front so to speak <laughs> and. Um, uh, yeah, so actually, I, I moved pretty quickly. I moved to the to the Eastern Front with with my with my interests, and uh, yeah, um, so combining the Eastern Front uh, with this idea of uh, Germans and Germany, um, you end up in Eastern Germany. Yeah, and then there are a few cities that come to mind. Uh, Breslau is is a city that is uh, uh, very often talked about, uh, and and Königsberg is is another city now and. Then, uh, during my undergraduate, I, I learned okay, there is actually already quite some research into into Breslau, especially from a military perspective. There were some uh, good works out there, but for for Königsberg, I, I found there's only a few scattered memoirs that are mostly very self-serving and uh, completely unobjective and uh, outdated, obviously. And I thought, you know, this is this is what I would like to know more about, and yeah. And here we all are. Well, I, I I completely understand why you're interested in that. I've always been slightly interested in Königsberg, and not least because it's this this sort of jewel, isn't it, in the Baltic? It's a it's you know a, it's a, it's an ancient city. It's um it's a pretty beautiful city, and and it just gets totally destroyed in the war, doesn't it? And, and, and you know everything that it stood for for centuries is just completely wiped and it sort of rest and, and it sort of gets reborn with a different name and a, you know it's almost like a it's been raised and leveled and started again i mean it's the most extraordinary thing it has a 700 year old history like a, a proud let's say german german teutonic history yeah. that that goes back very very long uh, yeah just a very proud uh, a traditional society I'd, I'd say more traditional than than the rest of uh, and the rest of Germany, it 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 is uh, most definitely it but, but, is, it's 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 a German people but, living there, but um, but historically uh, in a sort of colonial style, right? The, 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 it this... is it is Germany's easternmost outpost, absolutely. So like they 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 come with the sword, so to speak. They they say back in the Teutonic uh, days, and then uh, the plow follows. That is sort of their their narrative, and uh, obviously. Uh, the Nazis, they, they, they hold on to that narrative. They, they absolutely use that. They, 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 they see East Prussia as sort of as an idea of, of how you can uh, you how you can bring um, German like the German sphere of influence. How you can uh, export that, if you will. So if you look at East Prussia's Gauleiter, so East Prussia's Nazi leader is a, is a guy called Erich Koch, and he is infamous basically throughout Eastern. Europe. He, he becomes the ruler of uh, of Ukraine, and and uh, to him, agriculture and agriculture uh, autonomy that that is uh, basically the be all and end all uh, for him. And yeah, so uh, you get into the situation where you have yeah East Prussia as this uh, as this traditional province with this agricultural uh, foundation to it, and that is how East Prussians style themselves. Now, obviously. Um, this all comes to a, a crashing halt in, in, in August 1944. You have uh, the Royal Air Force comes in um, twice in, in a week, in the last week of August. And I want to stress, because I think a lot of people have struggled locating where this is on the map of Europe. <laughs> this is so far into what we consider to be Eastern Europe. This is, you have to... Uh, go beyond Poland. This is how far yeah. Germany reached. So uh, back in the day. So if you want to have a parallel, how far the Royal Air Force went uh, uh, those those nights. This is an eleven-hour round trip. Yeah. It is as if the Russians were to bomb Paris uh, yeah. while uh, while uh, the the Allies were in Normandy. Yeah. That is how how far this is uh, eastwards. Yeah, yeah. So. It is so far. So basically, uh, uh, a uh, like like uh, one of the first attempts of really using phosphor in, in a way like similar to to Hamburg, for example, 
1943. And then a year later, um, the, the city is besieged, uh, besieged by four full armies, and then basically uh, is captured. So you first have two major uh, Royal Air Force bombardments, and then four armies, four uh, Soviet armies, uh, basically plow through uh, uh, that city with uh, a staggering two and a half thousand uh, planes of the Red Air Force, which is a third of the entire Red Army's Air Force at that point, contributing in these efforts. So at the end of uh, of the war, very little is left of Königsberg. But, but Bastian, I think it's, it's, it's important to, to say that after the end of the First World War, it is, you know, Königsberg, as it then is, is... is at the heart of East Prussia, which is this enclave, it, it, it's it's separated, isn't it, from the rest of? Hold on, Germany. Jim. We should we should make the point if people are looking for this on the map on their Google Maps while we talk about it, they're not going to find Königsberg because it's Kaliningrad. Yeah. After yeah. all, yeah. in the Kaliningrad Oblast, which is you know in a reversal of what we're talking about, is now a Russian outpost outside Russia, you know between you know next door to Poland. And it's sort of like it's it's a flipped situation, perhaps now. Would you agree yeah, with that, Bastian? Yes, it's now wedged between Lithuania and um, yeah. and Poland. And uh, yeah, it's like tying into what James said, and 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 also what 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 do you say, Al? It's it is exactly it's the exact opposite of what it was after the First World War, where you have like the famous Polish corridor that comes into being after Versailles. And this yeah. basically uh, grants Poland access to the sea. But what does it mean? Everything east of it, which is East Prussia, uh, is now cut off from the rest of Germany. So East Prussia is being cut off completely from Germany. Uh, then uh, in 1920, uh, a revolt takes place in, in the city of Memel in the far north. Uh, that is then taken away. Uh, this is uh, handed over to uh, to Lithuania, this becomes the, the city of Klaipeda. Um, in, in the south, you have areas that have to be given over to, to Poland. So East Prussia becomes an embodiment of what the Germans call the bleeding frontier. Like they are bleeding territory. And so you have this deep fear of everything that is considered to be Eastern or Slavic. There's such deep, deeply ingrained fear. So this is not only this uh, the 700 year old Teutonic history. No, this is also very acutely uh, remembered. And even during uh, the First World War, this is also something that we tend to forget a little bit because we focus uh, quite a lot on the, uh, on the Western Front, of course. Yeah. Uh, but East Prussia is the only uh, province that is invaded uh, and, uh, by, uh, uh, by the Russians, of course. And uh, no other um, German province German area sees fighting on its own soil. But the only place in Germany during the First World War where fighting takes place is in East Prussia. And this uproots also hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of, uh, um, of refugees. So if you're older than 40 years old, you remember this, you have experienced this in, in the Second World War. So if you are 40 in 1939, you were 15 uh, by the time, basically, when the First World War starts, so give or take. Yeah. You remember this. You remember this acutely. It, it's not something of lore. It's not something of old old days, something that your grandfather once told you. No, you were there. Like, you saw these refugees and you, were, uh, you could have been part of it. So it is very acutely remembered. Gosh, I hadn't, obviously that hadn't occurred to me because, because uh, we, we our focus here is so firmly on the Western Front. And actually, you know, the war, and the, 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 it's a more fluid war, isn't it, on the, uh, the, the, so on the Eastern Front. Think, things, you know, armies come and go, basically, don't they, in a way that they just don't in the West. Absolutely. And this is also why in the Second World War, uh, there is this confidence that uh, the German army will once again pull it off. Because this is what happens in the First World War. You have yeah. Hindenburg, uh, who is basically... Uh, uh, the star of the show there, together with, uh, with Ludendorff, of course, who basically, Hindenburg as a young man, like it's hard to imagine Hindenburg as a, as a young man, because we always know him as this yeah. mustachioed uh, old uh, Prussian. Uh, but, you know... Yes, looks like a wall, a... he looks like a walrus in our imagination, yes. doesn't he? Yeah, basically. But, 
there was a day somewhere in the mid uh, 1800s where he was in fact a young man and uh, when he was a young man he he was in um, he was stationed in in Königsberg and he was especially interested in the in defending East Prussia and what do you have in the east of East Prussia you have uh, the Missourian lakes these are called so this is a uh, yeah a lake district and uh, it is very uninhabitable it's it's basically it's half swamp it is half you know lakes in the middle of that is like a, it's, it's Lutzen is an important town Rastenburg which you of course know from from uh, uh, from Ger uh, from from Hitler's headquarters so yeah so this 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 is a very important uh, a part to uh, and Hindenburg builds his uh, defenses and his defensive ideas around these lakes and it is wildly successful uh, he basically uh, with a very small force he defeats two Russian armies uh, that basically come as a pincer and he he, he cuts them uh, he cuts them completely off and it's incredibly successful once something very similar happens in 1944 a lot of these Russians think okay you know we know how this is going to go yeah we will have to to flee a little bit and um yeah uh, we will once again uh, be victorious and don't forget of course which i think a lot of people uh, tend to really truly take into account but the deep racism uh, that helps explain this yeah um they actually think that the uh, that the soviets or the red army they are just you know like swamp people they are asiatic hordes there's no yeah. leadership to them uh, they believe this much deeper, much stronger, with much more sincerity than they did in 1914. So a lot of people have no doubt that that war will, go, will end well. Of course, with the knowledge of hindsight and, you know, like uh, being able to to immerse yourself in sort of like strategic uh, concerns taking place at, the, at, at, at Hitler's high command, you know, like, okay, this is absolutely not the case. But how can a... Uh, an average farmer in in the east of East Prussia uh, know this. He can't. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, th this is what basically uh, sparks a massive uh, refugee uh, crisis uh, uh, a few months later. So, so it goes. For, so the pendulum swings, doesn't it? From from thinking you'll easily defeat the Russians because they're because they're subhuman to being absolutely terrified of them because they're subhuman. And, and yeah, who, exactly. who, who knows what savagery they will unleash. And also the component that people know perfectly well what they've been doing in in uh, in the Soviet Union in terms of how brutally they've treat, treated the, the subhuman. I mean, it's it's yeah. the way it's the way it, this sort of fire feeds itself is um, yeah, is absolutely. It's really interesting, isn't it? But but the geography yeah. of Königsberg is, is that that once you're pushed back to Königsberg, it. You've got nowhere else to go. It's a bit like kind of yeah. being at Dunkirk, apart from kind of evacuating, which of course lots of people did. But but well, one of the main differences between Königsberg and uh, and then Dunkirk, for example, is Königsberg does actually have a large hinterland. It's called like the Samland. It's a massive peninsula, lies lies beyond it. So uh, obviously it's, it's very hard. But it's not, but it is sort of on the sea, isn't it? It it, it is on the sea, but uh, it it does then continue. Uh, westwards a little bit and you know you, you do you would have you know, like in a dream scenario so to speak you would have the opportunity to uh, have agriculture there still while you're being besieged which is exactly what happened so like uh, people were just still tending the fields in in uh in in the spring of 1945 being constantly strafed by the um by the soviets of course so what well so Königsberg ends up a festung yeah, um, a, like a, a fortress, a fortress city, um, and, and there yeah. are the, the 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 Germans are notable for doing this. Um, uh, you know, they do it in Western Europe as well. We, 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 with the with the various ports, what is the thinking behind these Festung cities? Because up to this point, the the Germans have tried to ex tried to do tried to be mobile in their prosecution of the war rather than get stuck, um, uh, and this would appear to be. I mean, what's the uh, aside from heroic resistance in the face of the Asiatic hordes? You know, which, uh, I suppose would be the, a propagandistic way mm -hmm. of looking at it. What's what's going on st strategically here, or is or is anything happening strategically in the thinking? Is it to tie Russians up? You, you're absolutely right that this is a 
a very much misunderstood uh, concept because well first of all a lot of people think it's it's a it's an ex- it's purely an extension of hitler's propagandist boast yeah. like follow, follow yeah. where you stand right and i would concede that in the soviet union which is where these where you first see these these fortresses in, in march 1944 this is 100% the case he cannot allocate any goods to it um, there can no be there can be no security yeah. garrisons allocated because every person that you uh, need for a security garrison needs to be taken off the front line. Yeah. Um, uh, there are no stocks that can be brought to it. Uh, so um, too many problems to to solve. Now, what happens? Uh, and here we have to really understand the concept of, of total war, because this this is where it becomes. Uh, not only important, but where you where you see it in practice, is in 1945, or like better put, in the in the autumn of 1944, um, a string of German cities is now allocated as fortresses, and here the thinking of the German military command becomes very differently, because now they say, okay, our supply lines are shorter. We know in advance that they're that they're coming. But here's the kicker, um, we can have our own civilians and uh, second rank uh, soldiers, uh, Volkssturm men, so like militia men, we can put those in, uh, in these fortresses to, uh, to defend them. Uh, these, uh, these cities, for example, these German cities, and this is where the history comes in, they used to be already Prussian fortresses, so they have this ring of Prussian forts around them, sort of like of this, of this big red brick um, fortresses normally with uh, like uh, overgrown at that point these are as a ring around city so it is not the city itself that you should see as a as a fortress uh, within military thinking but rather the uh, the, the city and its wider uh, environment so all these fortresses they can offer artillery support to to one each other, uh, to, to one another that is how they've been set up already during the Prussian era so they can basically uh, offer support to each other um, but this can be done with second rank units. You don't need yeah. uh, 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 super units in a uh, uh, in a fort. This can be older men, which is what happens, or uh, men with. Uh, how hard uh, can it be to kind of fire a fixed gun? Is that the idea? Yeah, exactly. And this is also the beauty. Uh, where do where do all these guns come from, right? Uh, but uh, these are just uh, old uh, French guns that they have in stock since 1940. They have been uh, uh, kept in good nick uh, during uh, uh, during the war years, and they are just sit there. Uh, you can do absolutely nothing with them if you are heading uh, into into in, into Russia in 1941, of course. But they are very very useful uh, in in a fixed position. Uh, so and that is what happens. So like here, you solve two things. You solve the fact that you don't have uh, uh, oil at your disposal anymore. Because that is, becomes obviously a very big thing, uh, like the Plusti uh, oil fields in Romania, they are under threat. Um, yeah, uh, all the all the synthetic oil it just becomes harder. So you basically have to come up uh, with a strategy that takes uh, the maneuver out of your uh, out of your considerations to win. So how do you do this? You say, okay, fix positions where we can actually rely on our own um, population. Um, and then counterattack because, like, that is of course the be all and end all of the final yeah. year of the war. It's like counter, like it's it's just a blanket thing that uh, you know, like uh, what is you know, like like what what is used quite often. But the beauty of a counterattack is that you don't need to uh, have massive operations anymore. Like these can just be uh, like like much smaller in in. Uh, in an in effort, and what you sort of hope indeed in a yeah. uh, with, with fortresses is that. Russians run at it and and just tire themselves out. That that is sort of the hope, and that is uh, very often that goes horribly wrong. Königsberg is surrounded by um, completely, isn't it? It's cut off from totally and surrounded by the Red Army by end of January nineteen forty five. Yes, it is, and yet it does it does hold out pretty much till the end of the war, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, Königsberg is uh, um, is designated a fortress in um, uh, in in late nineteen forty four. In January 1945, um, it goes under martial law. So this is where it becomes like a true fortress in the in, in, in the final sense of the word. Uh, but this means that stocks have been allocated to it well in advance, 
uh, uh, all the structures have been put in place already in in in, in November. That is all. Uh, that is all done. So uh, it is not that uh, the, the thinking still has to start uh, by the time the Russians approach. So the uh, the fortress has been been readied well well in advance, and uh, that that is what what marks uh, the difference. Uh, there is uh, three months of, uh, of of stock allocated to it. Uh, food has been well taken care of. People in Königsberg actually say that they um, suffered no. Um, hunger uh, as what happened in, in other parts of Germany in 1945. They basically all say, no, actually we had our, 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 our rations were, were pretty, pretty good, as, as long, of course, as you contribute to the defense of the city. Right. Because if you don't, uh, then you're no longer uh, eligible for, for rations. So, but as long as, you, as long as you contribute, you will have food. Well, that was going to be my next question, because um, if what you're relying on is the civilian popula population and sort of second tier um, people, how are how are the how I assume it's the Nazi Party? How how are the population of Königsberg and those second tier people being mobilised and motivated? Is there a difference because this is home soil? Because after all, we, we, we you know very often we talk about the war in the West. The the idea that there's a sort of change in tenor when um you know and you mentioned Arnhem right at the start of this very often the thing people say about the battle of Arnhem is well it's near germany so the germans are fighting with a sort of newfound ferocity or a newfound seriousness because because it's it's home soil almost is is that is that part of the character of what's happening in in königsberg or or is that is that not because it because because if if it's a prussian fortress outpost anyway in its mentality as a as a place and a culture, does does it make any difference? Yeah, I mean that that's really an an, an excellent question. Now it's uh, uh, what you see is that the propaganda actually changes in Königsberg during its siege, right? Because uh, Berlin is very very far away for uh, for 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 people. Like, why would you care about what the nation thinks if you and your family is being shelled, right? So yeah. they uh, they look for uh, heroes in their own past. So, for example, Immanuel Kant becomes important. Uh, York von Wartenburg, like uh, like old old Prussian um, uh, soldiers with like ties really to Königsberg itself. Yeah, these are being elevated in propaganda. Hitler really disappears from the from the front pages in Königsberg in the in the stage uh, of the war. It is much less uh, important. And what is of course means uh, because James you said you know is, is Königsberg completely encircled the reality is it is 90 percent encircled there is still right um, uh, they can leave on occasion through the like like the like, like a canal this is how some people um, get out of Königsberg in, in, in February. Because it's this lagoon, isn't it? There's this lagoon yeah. just just sort of to the uh, to the west of Königsberg. There's yeah. a river runs through it. I don't know what the name... What's the name of the river in, in Königsberg? Uh, the Pregel. And so that runs out of the city, then you get to the lagoon, and then there's a little sort of outlet that yeah. gets you out into the Baltic. Yes, like a, it's called the, the Frisian uh, Spit. So, right. Um, so you have the Frisian Lagoon and the Frisian Spit. And, and, uh, and it's, that, isn't it Operation Hannibal? Isn't that the name of the, the evacuation? Uh, well, <laughs> well, not uh, really. Yeah, yeah, yes and no. Uh, okay. There's much has been made out of uh, Operation Hannibal, and if you follow the sources, you actually will find that that there is. I mean, like this, this is going to this is going to be quite controversial, I'd say. But there is no Operation Hannibal. There is a <laughs> lot. Uh, okay, because, fine. Uh, there are. Which is not to say that there are a, a, a very large number of incredibly brave uh, uh, captains who go back and forth. But if you look right. at... So lots of people are evacuated. A lot of people are evacuated. Uh, but uh, at the same time, more people evacuate uh, themselves, uh, as in they go over that spit uh, from Königsberg to Danzig. Uh, and then uh, either they, they stay there or, um, uh, or or move on. Uh, then again, right. others who are uh, evacuated by ship, they end up, for example, in uh, in Denmark or like in the north of Germany. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, or the bottom of the Baltic. Yeah. So uh, yes, that is yeah. uh, on, on, like like yeah. the Wilhelm Gustloff. Yeah. Uh, there's yeah. These are the, the biggest ships disaster like ship disasters or naval disasters ever. Like yeah. you have to imagine uh, the Wilhelm Gustloff in size of uh, lives lost. This is six times uh, Titanic. Yeah. Uh, what, what goes lost there? It's, it's like 9,600 people. Yeah. Like like, isn't it? it's, it's, I can't recall the number. It, it, it's huge. It is, it is a huge number. And uh, the reality of it is we'll probably never know the real number because so many people just went on board without uh, the accurate paperwork. Yeah, so yeah. we know we have 6,000 people that we know for sure. Like they had paperwork. But then at that point, basically, the captain says, keep them coming, keep them coming. We have to take everyone we can uh, out of there and uh, this happens uh, multiple uh, multiple times that the, these ships are are torpedoed so not only the the Gustloff, but you have uh, like the Steuben and the Goya which also have uh, over 6,000 each Jesus uh, wow and um, wow, wow, wow. these are these are insane numbers but still keep in mind this all amounts to uh, less than than one percent of all the, the people being evacuated so yeah. Obviously, we, we are very much drawn to to these horrible, horrible losses, and they should absolutely be recognized as such. But by and large, most people who, who get on a boat actually do get uh, to at least... They do get, get away. To, to, to a next stop, at least. I mean, a lot of them then still end up uh, in, uh, in, in in Soviet hands, because, uh, yeah, you still... <laughs> like, not everyone goes to Denmark. A lot of people just end up in... Uh, in Gotenhafen, which yeah. is today's uh, Gdynia, so which is just near of uh, uh, near Danzig, Gdansk. We need to take a quick break right now. We're talking to Bastian Willems. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. James and I are talking to Bastian Willems about Königsberg and the war on the Eastern Front. So, Sebastian, you know, paint a picture. You know, I'm I'm in Königsberg. It's I don't know. It's the 28th of February, 1945. You know, what's the city like? Is it is it already completely trashed? Um, are shells coming in all the time? How much bomb damage has been done by the RAF, etc., and by the uh, by the Red Army Air Forces at this stage? Am I carrying in a cellar? What you know? What am I doing if I'm just an ordinary citizen? Let's let's consider consider the, the average, say, fifty year old man uh, at at perfect uh, yeah at at the um, uh, at twenty eight February nineteen forty five. So uh, shortly, like in in the middle of February nineteen forty five. The Germans actually managed to break out from Königsberg to Pilau. And they, they managed to fight open a corridor. Uh, after the war, these command, uh, commanders will claim, we did that to get civilians out. Um, but you don't see any care being taken uh, for these civilians at all, really. And they have, like as I said, they have to stay in the city to help with the defense. This includes uh, women. This includes children. You have uh, uh, kids as young as eight who are... Um, asked to use their sleds to hold grenades, to pass artillery coordinates. Um, uh, uh, women are uh, or, like ordered to uh, report to Volkssturm units, obviously not to fight, but for example, to, to mend uh, socks, to, to fix uniforms. So every Volkssturm unit has a group of women attached to them uh, that do this sort of work. Everything, of course, to free up every last man uh, to to the front, and of course uh, the men um, themselves, they are at the front now. If you are a fifty year old man, this means that you uh, grew up uh, with a set of values that predates national socialism, right? Yeah. So um, this means that uh, you might not be as indoctrinated as uh, as these small uh, Hitler youth boys, for example, uh, but you would either be in a a Volkssturm unit or a a fighting unit. Well, let's let's say you're in a in a Volkssturm unit. Um, this means that you would be uh, placed in in the south of the city, uh, where the front is basically has stabilized. Uh, so uh, they take the the, the Soviet uh, sorry the the German command. It takes out all useful units basically uh, to free them up. So there's basically no tanks more 
uh, no tanks in, in the south of Königsberg. This uh, is all being replaced by, um, by, by these men of poorer, poorer quality. Yeah. Uh, so that basically they can be seen walking around through the trenches. So if a, if a Red Army commander is to, to look to his binoculars, uh, he will see a movement in the trenches. But obviously it's hard to see if this is a 50-year-old man or a, uh, you know, a, a, a 25-year-old hardened veteran from, from the Eastern Front. It always reminds me a little bit and, uh, of, if you ever saw Home Alone, uh, yeah. the movie, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you have this famous scene where Macaulay Culkin puts all these uh, cut-out uh, uh, images in, in, front of, uh, <laughs> in front of his window to, to, uh, to, to imply that there's a lot of activity uh, in the house so that the, the intruders don't break into the house. Uh, uh, and that is always what it reminds me of. It's, it's just uh, like it's not much more than, than, than a cutout, um, um, yeah, shapes basically. Because like these men yeah. are uh, absolutely useless and they know it and the Soviets know it too at some point. Because obviously uh, Soviets go on, on, uh, on very focused raids with the purpose of capturing yeah. uh, soldiers. Like yeah. they, they organize, you know, like, like as, as it happens uh, everywhere, of course. Yeah, uh, yeah aggressive um, patrolling, yeah. Yeah, so just take someone out, see, okay, what are the men of your unit? <laughs> and that is, uh, okay, well, it's, uh, you know, they just captured the, the, the 60-year-old. It's like, actually, everyone, <laughs> in my, uh, everyone in my unit is, is born before 1900. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, like, he's just absolutely tired. So no one wants it. And, and uh, the Soviets will produce leaflets and say, we know who you are. Why don't you just surrender? Yeah, or put 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 down your your weapons, which is also what happens, of course. At this, you know, February twenty eighth, nineteen forty five. Do you have, you know, uh, people being executed for not for not pulling their weight? Uh, or, or... Oh my god, it's so many. Yeah, exactly, because it's it's famous that there's there's obviously there's the, the you know slightly later on, sort of April, there's a sort of wave of suicides, and people. I mean, in Berlin, famously, there's people mm. running around hanging people and shooting people for not yeah. taking part. Is that going on in, in Königsberg at, at yeah, this point? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, it, it always has to do with the proximity of the front. So the reason that this happens in Berlin in, 1940, in, in April is because the front is closed in April. In, yeah. in Königsberg, this happens from January. Um, so like this predates all these uh, all the orders that we have sort of like yeah. come to know. And you have like the... The, the famous order written by Tirak, yeah. uh, like from, from mid-February. But the only thing that um, Tirak does here, like um, he's, uh, he's the Minister of, uh, of, uh, Minister of Justice, is he, he formalizes something that is, is long taking place. Like by, by the time the, the German army retreats back onto German soil in mid-1944, it has already uh, executed about 28 um, thousand um, of its own this is yeah. two full divisions yeah that uh they they basically put against the wall uh, of their own wow Jeez. And, Twenty-eight thousand. Um, god yeah and um so in, in Königsberg, you see that this um, um this goes even further um uh, we have quite a lot of reports from um from people from Königsberg who attest that it is uh, about 30 a day People being executed at, at the height. So throughout March, so 28th uh, of February is basically, um, yeah, like th that is like a normal day. Uh, the, 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 yeah. the beginning of it, so to speak, uh, sees uh, from that point you have roughly uh, 30 uh, executions a day. And this is uh, like consider soldiers within the biggest inverted commas ever because these, yeah. the men being executed. They're not soldiers. These are uh, a lot of old men, uh, young boys who have been drafted into the military, have no time to um, acclimatize to, to military life. Uh, they have been told, now you are a soldier, um, as happens with, with a lot of uh, militia, basically overnight. And this overnight is, uh, we know this to be 28 of, uh, of January, actually one month uh, earlier. This is when the city uh, becomes under martial law. No one really has been introduced to whatever martial law is. But what happens now is things that cons were considered to be very normal. 
uh, they are now punishable with that. So you are uh, a woman who has to take care of her family. You go into the house of your neighbor who you know fled uh, westwards. Um, two weeks ago, this was theft, punishable by, you know, uh, a few weeks or months in prison, uh, if you will. Uh, but it still worked the risk. Under martial law, this is looting. It is punishable by death. And that happens. Um, uh, it, uh, the same goes for men who change into uh, civilian clothing. Like yeah. they, they are just scared men and nothing more, nothing less. And uh, But obviously, this is desertion. This is a phantom flute, eh? yeah. right? So like fleeing from the colors. And that is, is punishable with death. So this is what happens. So you have all these people who are mentally civilians, but because they are under martial law, everything changes for them. They're under different rules and yeah, and limitations. So to, who's answerable? Is this Koch who's answerable for this? No, this is because uh, um, he survives the war, doesn't he? He's, he... He, he's well, like this is also uh, to my personal frustration. All these guys uh, survived the war. It's it's always the uh, wow. Uh, uh, but uh, I'd like to uh, use this opportunity because already L uh, referred to it as well. We always go very hard on the on the party, right? right. The party man is the is the linchpin of uh, late war violence, right? Yeah, yeah. But here here you have a military that has been completely uh, brutalized after three years of fighting on the Eastern Front. They have committed acts of genocide. They have evacuated hundreds of thousands of uh, Soviets without any regard uh, of their life. They have been killing their own, uh, like as I said, in massive numbers for, yeah. for three years straight. Um, these are the men, these hardened veterans, this core of very hardened veterans that are now put in places of seniority. Uh, these are now the men who call the shots. So these hardened veterans... So martial law, I'd like to stress, is military, right? Yeah. It is not, uh, it is not uh, a domestic law uh, brut uh, brutalizing. No, this is military law imposed on a, a domestic setting, right? So um, a lot of people are very eager to blame Koch. And he is, uh, he had, this man has many, many, many faults. And um, uh, this should not be uh, dismissed. But what is happening in, in East Prussia uh, especially what is the army uh, it's the army it, it, it's the army like he takes very poor care of the evacuation of civilians uh, but even the, the Volkssturm which is very often uh, again like uh, we see this as this this uh, party apparatus uh, especially in eastern Germany um, this is uh, the army that basically incorporates them uh, uh, in its ranks. In, in the West, I would say it's a little bit different. There you see it is more the, uh, more the party. But in the East, they incorporate them in their units uh, completely and uh, use it as a, as a manpower pool, if you will. So basically, by the time you have uh, a, a good Volkssturm unit that is uh, worthy it's sold, they will be incorporated in a uh, in, in a military division, basically. But, but Bastian, from what you were saying earlier, you know, that, that this sort of, we're in East Prussia, which has this kind of, uh, you know, very racial, racist view of Slavic people and all that. So, is it that this is fertile ground for this sort of brutality in a way that other parts of Germany aren't? Is East Prussia different in this respect to other parts of Germany? Or is this... Or is this, a, as you say, a product of th three, four years of fighting the Russians in an, in an incredibly brutalised uh, uh, series of campaigns? Is it, is, it, is it something to do with East Prussia or is it, uh, or is it not? Or, 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 I mean, obviously, that's either or is too well, strong, but um, what's yeah. the contributory factor? Yeah, like, well, certainly it's not either or. This is a lot yeah. of things coming together. Yeah, yeah. So one of the reasons um, you, like you already pointed to, it's uh, like it's it's uh, the brutalizing army that comes back. And uh, it is worth noting that the East Prussians, they don't need that Nazi narrative of, um, yeah. of, of racial hatred. To them, it's 
standard hatred. They yeah. already they they hated uh, uh, the, the the Slavs long before uh, East Prussia uh, before Hitler came to power and had Hitler gone and they would still be in place. They would hate be you know like hating them today. So yeah, yeah. So I mean, like this this is you know like this is just part of their their culture, like for for better or for worse. Yeah. And um, so, like, this is not uncommon to them, which is also why they don't necessarily need all that, um, uh, like, like that Nazi fight propaganda. Of course, it Nazi propaganda, uh, like, like takes this to a whole new level. Uh, but you can, like, your propaganda can, by its very nature, only be successful if you're building on something that is already uh, held yeah. uh, in in the population. And yeah, yeah. in East Prussia. Uh, you don't need uh, a lot of trouble convincing people uh, and that that the Slavs are um, are no good. Are, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, in fact, you're probably you're probably you've got them saying at last someone who understands, at last someone in, in yeah. you know fancy old Berlin, in, who finally understands how how the world really works. I mean, is is as likely a reaction. I, 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 and it, gosh, this is all. I mean, this is so. In, so it's so interesting, and again, that the, the the Eastern Front operates on such a different, um, uh, you know, we, we we we've talked we've talked about the Eastern Front before about how that the 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 brutality of the fighting is actually the norm of the Second World War, and it's the Western Front that's the the exception. Um, in that people are t- in the in the Western Front, when you take your prisoners, you look after them, and and all that and all that sort of stuff. Do you think? Do you think that that's a characterization that 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 stands up? Uh, yeah. Well, absolutely. Although the one thing that I think should be stressed when it comes to the Eastern Front, like it's not one thing. We no. tend, as as Western historians and as you know, like people who are broadly interested, to think the Eastern Front is one thing. Yeah. But these are hundreds of different battlefields. Like the Eastern Front, uh, this. Like two thousand miles, I I think uh, lie between Leningrad and 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 or, and, and, and Stalingrad, right? Yeah. Uh, Six hundred miles between Brest and uh, and and Moscow. Yeah. These are distances that we we, we will struggle to understand that it's yeah. it's too big, right? So yeah. we just say the the Eastern Front as a, as a you know like like as a as an umbrella term. I understand that, but this is for a regular soldier. This is not not the reality. So you would have been part, for example, of the advance on, on Moscow or the advance on, on Leningrad. Yeah. And then the retreat back from, from, this, from these places. But this means that you, know, like you, you had nothing to do with what is happening in, 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 in the Caucasus so, uh, or, 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 or something like that. So your war is your war and it, it defines you in a very specific uh, way. So if your unit just so happens to... Uh, be very good in during retreat setting entire villages on fire you're more li- more likely to to do that in the next village that you enter yeah. uh, as well yeah so you see and this is also what happens when uh, german troops moving back in in uh, uh, onto his prussian soil cutting down trees to make firewood for example which is what you tend to do normally they just strip the houses uh, where they are staying so they are now stripping uh, his prussian houses and this right. to like Everyone is absolutely outraged uh, about this. Of course, uh, within the grand scale of things and with, with, with now knowing like the things to come, this is all very minor. Uh, but uh, you have report upon report saying, what is our military doing here on our own soil? They are they're stealing my rabbits. Uh, they are uh, opening beehives to find um, uh, honey. Uh, which uh, like and all my bees died because I could have told them that it is winter. Uh, there are no bees, but now they uh, it's like it's, yes. they're they're all dead. They are uh, destroying my crops. Uh, they're taking uh, they're taking my horse away. They slaughtered my pigs. Just everything yeah. everything that you that this army in retreat had been doing, they continue doing because the enemy in front of them is the same. Um, the way in which they operate, uh, like th- their unit structures remain the same. Uh, so there tends to be uh, a very curious, at least I think, way in which we look at 
uh, the fighting in Germany in 1945. It's almost completely detached from everything before and after. Yeah. Uh, but like, so if you look at books on the on the Eastern Front, say, they all end in 1944. And then what happens to to these soldiers? It it it's, it seems that once they reemerge in, in the book on 1944, 1945, they're completely different men. It's like no, yesterday you were in in Lithuania, and today you fell back uh, from Lithuania to East Prussia because yeah, you know, like it's across the border. Yeah. you're the same person. Nothing has changed, and obviously you're now on home soil. But this is only one of the factors that determines your behavior. There's so much more that uh, like yeah. To, if you are from Bavaria, uh, you might not give a hoot about uh, East Prussia. Yeah. Uh, to you, it still it it still looks very like, well. East Prussia is is very traditional looking. So to you, you go, you know, it doesn't really look that different to to Lithuania. Well, and also you uh, might so- not even know where you are. One of the things we've always talked about on this podcast is very often if you're an individual soldier, you've no idea where you are. You've no idea what what that hill what that hill's called or what the river behind you's called. You don't know. Um, uh, so, so I mean, it's the idea that there's a sort of magical, magical property that when you're on, when you're fighting on German soil, suddenly everything's different. But I am struck by this idea that, that by the end of the war, you know, Königsberg is gone, you know, as, as a, you know, it's in ruins. It's, it's population has been, I don't know what, how, how many people were killed or left in those final months, but, but, you, you oh, know, it, 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 it's gone, isn't it? It's, just, it's basically kind of wiped from the earth. It's, it, and Kaliningrad it, it, emerges it, it, out, out of it. It is flattened. It is, it's completely flattened to, to the point where um, this is when this is so destroyed, we might as well just have completely a new street plan. Start so, again completely. God. Yeah, so um, very little uh, remains uh, 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 the, the same. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's amazing. And do we know how many people were killed in the battle? It it is very hard. To, it, it's very hard to say. Obviously, I I can give some estimates because it's not only the battle. It's it's also the the period that that follows. Because what you have is a you have to, we think that roughly one hundred thousand people were in Königsberg when the uh, by the time the battle started, which is still a very large number. Again, due to the fact that not everyone was evacuated, but needed for the for, for the defense, right? Uh, so you have about 100,000 people in uh, the uh, in, in, in the city. So after four years, which is when Königsberg is completely closed off um, to, to Germans, every German has to be taken out. Only 25,000 um, uh, are, are taken out, basically. So we know that we, we lost 75,000 on the way. Now, not everyone dies to do uh, to fighting it's also for example malnutrition disease uh, because, and all, all those things uh, yeah. uh, 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 disease uh, you have outbreaks of uh, uh, malaria for example becomes very common in in, in this area um, uh, typhoid uh, all uh, like, like all all these things um, 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 uh, of course a lot of these Prussians are used uh, as, uh, as as forced laborers themselves now in uh, in Russia, so uh, this is also like tens of thousands of um, East Prussians that are taken eastwards. Some of uh, some of them, of course, never uh, return again. Uh, so uh, it is very hard to say how many uh, exactly died during the battle. But I would argue that's you know like that's not even that relevant. I mean, like yeah, it's, like in, in in many cases. It, it might be better to be to, to be killed by, by by the first grenade, so to speak, rather than suffering three three years to it and, yeah. and then first seeing your uh, your family die and then dying yourself. I yeah. mean yeah. like obviously it, it sounds very cynical. I, I, I know that, but uh, like this is the this is the reality. A, a, a lot of people uh, for uh, for expressions, especially the war only started in 1944 and ended in 1948. So May 1945 to them meant nothing. Yeah. To 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 us in the West, that is the end of the war. So, yeah. Uh, what does this mean for my personal suffering? Nothing. In East Prussia, they the, the suffering had really only just begun at that point. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. But yeah. well, Bastian, you know, we're, we're we're kind of running out of time, but but but. You know, when you were when you were doing this work on on East Prussia and um, Königsberg, 
you know, where, where are you finding your sources for, for kind of, you know, eyewitness accounts and all the rest of it and the experience of, of what people went through? Yeah, this is actually, um, it was pretty hard to, to reconstruct the, the story of Königsberg because there, you know, like there is no city archive. The city archive, of course, is destroyed, right? Uh, uh, where, where do all your sources end? Uh, a lot of uh, corpse orders uh, uh, are destroyed. Uh, we are actually, interestingly enough, every, um, every so often, I, w- I would say every three years or so, uh, a, a, a Russian um, treasure hunter uh, digs up a uh, a suitcase full of corp- corpse orders. A lot of uh, right. of these guys seem to seem to have buried them. That happens constantly. So, <laughs> um, so like every now and then, just something comes up, right? Uh, but uh, uh, for for the rest, uh, you find them in in the archives in Berlin, uh, in in Freiburg. You have uh, uh, smaller museums uh, in in uh, in Lüneburg. In, um, in in a town called Ellingen in yeah. Duisburg, uh, but like the Yad Vashem in uh, in Jerusalem, uh, in in Kew, of course. Um, yeah, I'm 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 forget uh, in Kaliningrad itself, of yeah. course. Right. And what's Kaliningrad um, like now? Does, I mean, obviously there's some buildings that have survived. I mean, but 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 is it a is it a nice place to visit or is it pretty rough? Well. It is a very it is uh, like obviously with all that is happening in Ukraine it is uh, it's hard to say but I'm I'm still saying I love Russian people and they like not not their leadership but to me Königsberg doesn't exist anymore yeah uh, you see very little of it uh, but if I am in Kaliningrad uh, I am always welcomed I am like uh, uh, like like the the people there they are long and old friends that I truly appreciate. And uh, that is what makes, uh, to me, uh, Kaliningrad and the Kaliningrad Wider Oblast so, so interesting. It's, it's more the, the, the smaller places. If you really want to see old Germany, I would suggest not going to Kaliningrad itself, but to the many coastal uh, villages yeah. that, that surround it. Because it, it, that is actually very beautiful and uh, sort of like slow living uh, 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 vibe, if you will. Like these are all old uh, like cure water as they call them like uh, sort of like uh, like spas yeah uh, spa spa towns because you know like it, it, it's all the fresh sea air so to speak and yes, you uh, sit, sit on the beach in a strand corp don't you one of those sort of uh yeah, wick wick exactly. wicker uh sedan chairs yeah 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 while massive battleships pass in front of you yeah because that is that's the interesting thing like these are massive military ports so we have we have quite some pictures where you indeed you see them in this in these wicker chairs and in these yeah. old nineteen twenties thirties wicker chairs, uh, you know like like with, with somehow which which they also have like have these little like Hitler flags uh, uh, next to them uh, like Jubelfahne they would call them and they just like they have them uh, sort of like cordoning off where they're. Uh, where they've put down their towels, and then in the back you will see some uh, some some battleships just passing through because you know, because the Germans considered up to 1940 the the Baltic Sea basically their their personal inland sea yeah. like that is just basically their their playing ground yeah and with uh, like like with Pilau uh, one of the most important ports uh, as was was Danzig. well um Bastian thanks so much for um coming to talk to us um it's just yeah, I mean, it's just, enjoyed it this is oh yeah it's just so fascinating and again uh, um. I mean, I think your point about the Eastern Front, that there isn't one Eastern Front, that, that after all this, you know, that the front stretches across several countries, let alone, let alone, uh, uh, you know, armies and cultures. And also, I mean, a lot of this is old battles being refought too, not just of the First World War, you know, events that have come and gone in this part of the world for hundreds of years. I mean, it, 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 it sits squarely in that sort of tradition, doesn't it? And... Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and the fact that there are fortress, there's a string of fortress towns in this Junkers colonized part of, of you know, uh, of the world, speaks of this ancient tradition of um, of uh, armies coming and going. I mean, people talk about Belgium being the cockpit of Europe, but you could argue that this is the cockpit of Europe. In the other direction, if Belgium is the cockpit, like this is most definitely to stay within the euphemism like that this is maybe the motives of it all yeah <laughs> the, yeah exactly you know the, yeah, yeah. You know, like, 
Yeah, I think I thought that was a really well a, a point, very very well made. I have to say, and, and as ever, it's um, you know, in this vast subject, it's great to be kind of made to encourage to think about things in a different way. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. Fantastic. Thanks for listening, everybody. We will see you soon. Goodbye. Cheerio.